All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our third and final session on collaborative working. Thank you for taking the time on a Saturday evening to join us. We have an amazing lineup of, lineup of speakers who will be speaking about the role of collaboratives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me quickly go over a few housekeeping points before we get started. This session is being recorded, so it can be shared with you and others who couldn't attend the, share, uh, the event. If you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. We will pick it up for discussion towards the end of the session. Please feel free to share any other inputs or comments in the chat window, which is a separate feature in Emmet. If you're sharing any comments on social media, please consider using the hashtags #ChaCha2021 or collaborations, along with tagging the nudge and any other relevant handles as you see fit. This session is also being streamed live on YouTube from the Nudge account, just for the information and if you wish to share it with any of your uh, other colleagues. So on to the session then. Both the COVID-19 pandemic and the response to it have been unprecedented. The ferociousness and the speed at which the pandemic impacted so many people necessitated a very rapid response and coming together of organizations in ways never witnessed before be it grassroots organizations, foundations, corporates, or government agencies. They all came together in very innovative ways to help counter the short and the long tail of the crisis. This session will explore the lessons learned in the last one and a half years and how these lessons can be applied to address systemic deficiencies. In the first part of the session, our speakers will be sharing their experiences of putting together and building these collaboratives before we hand it over to Banya to take the discussion forward. It's now my pleasure to introduce the speakers for today's session. We have Nakin Maheshwari, who's a co-founder of GAME and the founder of Pudyam Learning Foundation, which focuses on developing entrepreneurial mindsets in today's youth. He's very passionate about discovering and unleashing human potential and entrepreneurship. An early employee of Flipkart, who went on to become their chief people officer, he left Flipkart in March 2016 to focus on developmental challenges. He is one of the early members of ACT Grants and continues to serve on its investment committee. We have Ashif Sheikh, who is the co-founder of Gran Sahas, a human rights organization. A winner of the Sadhbhavna Award and the Times of India Social Impact Award, he is very well known for his role in the Ashtriya Garima Abhyan, a campaign for eradication of manual scavenging. Gran Sahas anchors the Migrant Resilient Collaborative, which is a grassroots-led multi-stakeholder collaborative that focuses purely on the safety, security, and mobility of vulnerable migrant families. We have Shama Kalkan, who is the CEO of Swasti, uh, where she oversees its strategic direction and governance. She also drives the flagship Invest for Wellness initiative at Swasti. At the COVID Action Collab, Shama leads the domain specialist team, which is uh, very closely involved in the development, customization, and implementation of interventions uh, which are catering to the specific needs of vulnerable communities. I am very happy to share that in the past week, both COVID Action Collab and the Migrant Resilient Collaborative have been listed among the top last mile partnership initiatives to collaborate with by the World Economic Forum's COVID Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs. So congratulations to both of you. We are also joined by Ms. Uma Mahadevan, Principal Secretary, Panchayat Raj, she has also recently taken charge of the Women and Child Development Portfolio for Government of Karnataka. During the first and the second wave of the pandemic, she was the nodal officer for coordination with both the corporate sector and with the non-profit organizations for COVID response. Thank you, Mekin, Shama, Ashif, and Uma Ma'am for accepting our invitation to share your experiences and learnings with us. Without any further delay, I'd like to now turn it over to Mekin to uh, kick off the session by sharing the journey of ACT Grants. Thank you so much, Lakshmi, for the kind introduction. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I'd love for us to get into a conversation, so I'll try and keep this as uh, short as possible. Uh, but I am uh, excited and feel privileged to be sharing uh, the journey of ACT Grants uh, that um, I was fortunate to be a part of. Uh, a quick uh, quick recap to 
the beginning of wave one or how ACT grants got together. Um, and I think that reflects well on how collaboratives might come together. Uh, so wave one had hit us and some of us uh, in our helplessness were uh, mulling over the question of what can I do? Um, and a few WhatsApp groups got formed. One of them uh, that I was a part of what's called Startups versus COVID, which then went to went on to become too large to be on WhatsApp, went on to Telegram. And in, in parallel, a bunch of VCs got together and were asking the same question, like, what can we do? So at the core of it, like, the collaboratives got created because there was an urgency and an emergency and a need and a human desire to do something. Uh, I think very quickly, uh, the group got together and uh, because this was startups and VCs decided that we'll do what we can do, which is uh, raise money and support entrepreneurs. Uh, support entrepreneurs that are doing things to fight the pandemic. So that's really been uh, the basis of ACT. And I'll quickly take you through uh, a short five slider uh, so that I do not miss out representing parts of what ACT has done. Um, I'm assuming that my slide deck is visible. Yes, Megan. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is, that's really all, like no fancy reasons. Like we, we just had to act. That's why uh, this group came together. And that's, um, but there is a deep belief that everybody can be a co-founder of social change. Right? That everybody brings to the table something or the other which can lead to social change happening. Uh, and COVID gave us enough and more examples of just how that happened. And I'll talk to you. Uh, and, and I think one thing that, uh, that we all carried into ACT was the entrepreneurial DNA uh, or a startup way of working uh, and the intent of solving challenging societal problems at scale. Uh, so the scale bit has like has been key to many people who are part of ACT in their uh, in their lives, mostly in the for profit and the startup ecosystem, and that was true for us even in ACT. I think uh, I'll I'll skip over some of these, but now so ACT started out as pandemic response, but now uh, we're working. Uh, to expand our mandate to cover education, women, environment, and health. And there is a lot that we are continuing to grapple with, with the second wave, um, and possibly looking at what happens next. Uh, so, so that coming together of people, and just the, as in, I'm sure these numbers have grown, uh, right? So the sheer number of people who both contributed with time and money uh, with their networks, with access, and organizations. And you mostly hear of these organizations or these people in their for-profit avatars in startups scaling up. Um, but to see but to see them action in the philanthropic space, uh, I think just, just confirm that hey, every human has a heart and all of those hearts bleed towards doing something. So, so I think that every person can really work towards social change happening uh, came true and this slide in some sense captures a lot of that what we were able to do uh, and, and i won't go over uh, all of this but uh, there was significant impact created because of a uh, because of a learning mindset and willingness to be problem centric and work uh, with whoever could solve the problem uh, so there was an attempt or an effort to try and keep pace with the pandemic. Uh, so early on, we focused a lot on prevention and then uh, then moved to fighting and then enabling long-term capacity. Uh, but I would say we made enough mistakes. Uh, we learned on the way, like what we chose to focus on that, for example, we chose to early on focus on ventilator capacity being doubled. We enabled startups that could 
double the capacity of a ventilator um, and be impactful. But as numbers started pouring in, we realized that survival rates on ventilators were extremely low. So it was too late uh, by the time somebody got to a ventilator. And while ventilator capacity expansion was important, the number of people who could operate ventilators was still very, very few. Uh, so I, none of us came from healthcare and all of these were learnings for us. So, so I think being able to learn and stay agile uh, while being problem centric and then based on whatever the problem was reaching out to people who were probably the best in that domain uh, and it didn't matter uh, where they were in the world. Uh, so whether it was reaching out to universities globally or in India, for profits, non profits, startups, uh, we would like we would be unashamed about asking and figuring out like, hey, how can you how can we work together to solving this problem? I'll, in the second wave, uh, we focused on these three efforts in supporting government effort towards oxygenation, vaccination, and uh, rural health kits. Um, and I think uh, all of this was really possible because of uh, massive collective energy, uh, right? So if you think about it, ACT, as an organization, we've had one, one full-time person. Uh, everything else, everyone else has been a volunteer. We've had volunteer capacities come in from consulting organizations, from uh, like so Flipkart, from many other startups, and many, many, many individuals. Uh, who came together to make all of this happen. And I think just that volunteer spirit and willing to contribute and work together on a mission has been really what has got ACT in a little over a year uh, to be able to create the kind of impact that you see on your screens. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly take us through a couple, uh, couple of stories, like, We've talked about this uh, and the kind of operational support that was provided in most cases voluntarily by these organizations uh, has been just phenomenal. Uh, I'll, I'll talk through a couple of stories. I'll jump to this one. Uh, and this is classic uh, like wave two urgency, right? So I think this is in the peak of uh, wave two. Goa had just seen uh, over 145 deaths in a span of just two days, um, right? And I got a call, I think about 11:45, uh, from senior government officials saying that, "Hey, we know that you are moving OCs. Uh, can we get them uh, to go up fast? And how fast can we get them?" And initially, the plan was to take them uh, to truck them over. That would have taken about 36 hours. And they're like, "Hey, can't." can't wait for that long. Uh, and then in the span of an hour, uh, folks from the Indian Air Force uh, were reached. Uh, quickly, logistics were organized that, oh, there is, a, there is an aircraft which is waiting now, at, which, we, which can take off at 6 AM from your warehouse to the, uh, from deliveries warehouse to the aircraft. It's about three hours. So you can get there by four. And then, so, the number of people, organizations, so from government, uh, from the politician to the bureaucrats to Indian Air Force to for profit organizations like Delivery uh, and a volunteering team uh, around ACT and SWAST coming together to make, make something like this happen where what would have otherwise taken possibly three days for OCs to reach, we were able to get uh, two hospitals in less than, less than almost 10 hours of the first phone call about uh, the topic. I think being able to move with this kind of speed across these departments, so like an aircraft being arranged in almost no time um, is generally not possible. And it's worthwhile to reflect on what leads to collaboration of this sort happening. Uh, quickly move to uh, telling us, a slightly different version of a collective story of uh, basically being able to build out 105 uh, PSA plants. Uh, and again, in, in quick time across hospitals. Um, and how do you 
how do you make that happen uh, at in all of these geographies that are visible on the india map uh, and this requires this is non trivial while like there were different kind of challenges in getting oxygen concentrators to the 450 plus districts uh, that we were uh, that we were sending ocs to with psa plants there was a lot of work on installation on figuring out uh, possibility and capacity and i think the 60 plus volunteers organizations like kerni uh, on ground organizations bunch of startups coming up saying hey we can do this part we can figure out the feasibility and and going around and checking each of those locations for feasibility coming back with like oh in power we need this uh, we need this from a fire safety point of view and so on so i think being able to do that uh, and this as a result is a, is a very different example uh, of a collective i'll leave i'll leave you with uh, these learnings or paradoxes from the acp collaborative i think on one end uh, as we were working with the pandemic the need for acceptance of ambiguity because as in the virus was mutating everything around us was mutating uh, almost every other day and yet uh, looking for specificity specificity of role with partners so reaching out to partners for specific asks uh, and starting off with something specific and with some of our best partners the ambiguity eventually crept in and they did amazing things uh, regardless of uh, the specific role that we started out with but the specificity of the role initially led to uh, actioning happening quickly the second point which is like trusting partners like hey you've had a conversation the partner saying they will do this you you trust them and you enable them in all possible ways and there you again have the paradox of knowing fully well that a lot of these plans will fail so having a plan for failure uh, of, like if this doesn't work uh, then what's our plan b or what's our plan c to ensure that execution happens and it isn't it isn't about distrust in a partner it's about execution eventually not happening or the problem not getting solved and for that having plans um, and i think wearing this balance lightly uh, has been has been a key learning for act an ambitious mission and low ego teams just make things happen very very quickly and i feel this is uh, reasonably well known i experienced it deeply uh, over the last 14 15 months and finally uh, like problem centric intent uh, was able to bring for profits non profits governments volunteers all kinds of people together right that like the goa example is a good example of there is a there is an urgent uh, problem to be solved and who all need to be brought together just got together and acted so that's a uh, that's a quick summary of uh, the experience of act i'm trying to now get back to my and stop sharing yeah i i don't know I, i couldn't keep track of time as i was presenting but yeah back to you lakshmi to we'll take this forward thank you nakin and i think your last slide on the paradox is uh, really leaves a lot uh, for us to think over and uh, i'm sure leads to a lot of interesting question for the others as well um shama if i could ask you to go next and share uh, more about the covid action collab Thank you very much, Lakshmi, and uh, I'm absolutely happy to do that. Just give me a moment, and I'll bring up my. Um, let's see, uh, figure out Airstream and uh, get you to share my screen. Okay, I think we're going to have some trouble now. It's not bringing up my presentation, um, but I, I'm going to probably just start talking and try and figure that out uh, as we speak. Um, All right. So the COVID Action Collab and um, Zibi or Lakshmi, if you have the deck that I sent to you previously, and if you can try and bring that up, that makes it easier. Um, sure, Shama. Please continue speaking. We will bring up your presentation. All right. Great. Thank you. 
Um, so the COVID Action Collab, we're a, a people-centric network of multidisciplinary partners. Uh, we're implementers, providers, enablers, right? And our focus has been vulnerable communities. Um, even prior to the pandemic, the normal wasn't working for the, many of the vulnerable communities. And I'll talk about uh, which ones these are uh, very soon. Uh, and, and I think for us, when the pandemic hit us last year, the, the first quarter of last year, we started talking about uh, how are uh, these individuals, how are these populations going to not just survive the pandemic, and uh, but is this an opportunity for us to actually look at, um, could they be better off at the end of this pandemic, whenever that is, right? Um, so our focus has been people, vulnerable populations, uh, ensuring relief, recovery, and resilience building. Um, and uh, I, I think when the pandemic hit us and we were started talking about a collaborative, uh, this question of why do we need a collaborative? And I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about um, is collaborative, are collaboratives really necessary? I think when we launched the collaborative uh, just before um first lockdown was announced so actually march 23rd 2020 uh, is when the COVID action collab was launched we only knew three things at that point that we were really sure about uh, and this came from our experience past experience with disasters and epidemics and we said the most marginalized and the most vulnerable will be the worst hit uh, this is something that we've seen repeatedly and COVID was global, uh, and so the impacts were going to be really, really wide. Uh, it was going to hit all aspects of our lives. Uh, and COVID was not going to be about a few months or a few weeks. Uh, we knew that this was going to interventions or work was going to go over years. Uh, and therefore, recovery and resilience needed to be um, at least medium term, you know, two to five years, if not longer. Uh, and therefore, no single organization was going to be able to respond to it effectively. Um, I lead a public health nonprofit, we're a public health agency based out of um, Bangalore. Uh, and even for us at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot that we were having to learn and learn very rapidly. Right? And we said, uh, if we don't come together, we're not going to be able to respond to people. Uh, let me tell me if, uh, thank you very much. That is exactly the slide that I needed. If we can move to the next one, please. Um, so in when we launched the, the uh, collab, um, the, we've, we wanted to focus on the multidimensional issues of health, uh, livelihoods, nutrition, living standards. So you'll see that uh, on this particular framework on your screen, uh, we have people, families at the center, and we said these are the key issues that are going to affect them. Uh, and how these are going to be aggravated because of the pandemic uh, and therefore the um, and we know actually even prior to the pandemic there was question about whether we're going to achieve the sdgs by 2030 uh, and now this is uh, you know the pandemic has only aggravated those um, challenges so we put out this framework and of course it's evolved tremendously over the last um, nearly 18 months now um, the COVID action collapse strategy and focus um, is, is actually visualized in, on this framework. So the outcomes that we've been working towards, um, resilient and thriving vulnerable communities, uh, effective, efficient, resilient institutions, because most of these communities are reached via uh, organizations and institutions, um, and looking at whether we can create a dy dynamic humanitarian response ecosystem, right? Um, I think most of us have never experienced this kind of uh, situation ever in our lives before, but we said if we've come together, how do we stay and con continue to work together, not just on COVID, but um, something else that may come up subsequently in the future. Uh, our partners, like I've said, on the left-hand side of this framework are implementers, they're on-ground organizations, but we have a range of uh, organizations that are providers. Uh, they work on human resources, technology, uh, many other things, and there are enablers, academicians, um, um, research policy think, think tanks, and of course, government as well. And so we bring um, a variety of different assets, technical support, financing, and training to our partners. And uh, the whole focus is around capacitating, connecting, uh, and constructing. So capacitating is 
actually looking at what support partners require uh, to actually continue with their interventions or support specific interventions for vulnerable groups. The connect is between partners uh, and the rest of the ecosystem as may be necessary. And construct is to actually look at very specific problems that we've tried to solve for during the pandemic, right? Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go forward with examples. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, we focused on, as I mentioned, uh, communities that are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Um, so whether it's uh, sex workers, small farmers, uh, victims of uh, gender-based violence and child abuse, migrants, uh, health workers, street vendors. Um, so all of these uh, populations are hard to reach, uh, even in a non-pandemic situation, with the kind of support that they need. Uh, and in emergencies like this, the issues of inequity, injustice, and insecurity are only magnified. Uh, next slide, please. So the COVID Action Collab, um, we, we have a secretariat. We, um, we you know, we came together as a group of organizations. Uh, and since October of last year, we've uh, found support to create a secretariat. And all the collab partners um, actually get a variety of different kind of support based on um, their work that they're doing. So every partner, and we've categorized partners into three different types. Uh, there are implementers, providers, and enablers. And each type of entity is actually able to look at the value add for them uh, themselves in as part of the collab. Uh, so to give you an example for um, farmers, we were able to bring uh, Friends of World Women Banking, Rangde, together and, um, you know, enable low cost credit to farmers right and that uh, kind of connect and support where vulnerable groups get what they need in this case small farmers but partners like uh, friends of world women banking and run they are also able to come in and uh, play their role as well uh, next slide please in terms of progress, um, we are currently 333 partners. So these are 333 organizations across India. Uh, we have a pan-India presence. So partners are working in about 712 districts um, uh, out of the 741 districts that we have in the country. We are reaching 3 million people. Uh, with a variety of different uh, support, right? And uh, we have been able to leverage uh, or enable about 454 crores uh, of resources for people through just uh, entitlement facilitation alone. We've raised uh, quite a lot of other funding directly to partners for the work that they do. Um, moving to the next slide, please. The um, COVID Action Collab was incubated, ideated by the Catalyst Group. Um, I'm CEO of Swasti and we are one of the institutions or organizations that are part of the Catalyst Group. And uh, the group has been active in the social impact space for now over 25 years. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, we leveraged the understanding and the risk experience that we had with past emergencies uh, into the COVID collab. But we've been really fortunate to uh, put together or have stalwarts from different uh, sectors who've come together to guide, steer, um, and shape what the collaborative does. Uh, and our governing council um, is what is on your screen right now. We have um, various individuals from health and uh, outside of health as well. Um, next slide, please. So the uh, COVID Action Collab um, has, in terms of uh, programming or work that we've done, we've been um, responding to COVID based on the requirements of people on the ground. And um, this has changed in wave one and uh, was different uh, in wave one and has changed in wave two. And uh, looking forward, I think there are some very specific uh, initiatives that we have, but again, will be determined based on um, the dynamics of uh, COVID itself. Uh, we are currently working uh, on uh, a syndicated fund because one of the biggest challenges for uh, response on the ground has been funding for partners. And because the situation has been dynamic, it's very difficult to do traditional um, funding. Um, so we, we, you know, whether it was working with ACT uh, to enable supplies of uh, concentrators, working with other partners on actually setting up uh, health facilities like hospitals or COVID care centers, the needs have changed uh, very dynamically. And so um, we are putting together a syndicated fund to consolidate money. Um, there are very specific uh, initiatives that we have, uh, protect and care, which are very specific to health. 
uh, enabling resilient uh, systems in itself, uh, health systems and uh, looking at support to partners and then looking at uh, the future where we're talking about uh, livelihoods, education, etc. So very specific initiatives where uh, partners are coming in to support us. Um, we have specific communities. So we've seen an interest. We've had a lot of uh, organizations who wanted to work with artisans, for example, or specifically migrant. Uh, and these are opportunities for um, uh, various donors and, and other partners to come in and work with them. Uh, because we have such a um, wide presence across the country, we've been able to work with um, specific governments, specific populations, and uh, partners have chosen or can choose to work with us um, in specific geographies, uh, whether it's the Northeast um, or the Southeast or West. And uh, of the 333 partners, we have about 121 of them who are um, directly community facing, so the implementing organizations. And uh, we are now working, for example, um, on vaccines very significantly across the country, right? So demand uh, mobilization, uh, working with government to actually reach the most vulnerable, how do we prioritize them? Uh, and bringing in uh, funding and support for um, just the vaccine program itself, for example, is something that is an opportunity for um, anyone who wants to work with the collab to come in and do it. I'm going to actually um, stop there. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, and uh, Tanya, when you open it up for q and I'll talk about our um, you know, lessons and, and the way forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shama. Uh, Ashif, before we come back to you, uh, I think Kumanan has uh, an urgent meeting that has come up and she may have to leave the session uh, midway through. But I would like to uh, turn it over to her to uh, share with us how the government of Karnataka worked with civil society and the private sector to ensure um, appropriate timely support and response um, in, in the pandemic times. So Umanan would love to hear your experiences. Sure. Thank you. And uh, thank you to, to the Natch. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me uh, and for organizing this important discussion. Um, I'm sorry I have to uh, leave a bit early, but uh, I'm glad I have a bit of time to just share some of our thoughts. Um, I think uh, collaboration and finding ways to collaborate has been one of the great learnings of this entire one and a half years of the pandemic. Uh, we have found, um, speaking for myself and I think for many in the government, we have found that uh, what we often talk about as the conundrum or the problem of convergent action, the fact is that government works in silos, but we also know that that's a truism and that's the way in which big organizations have to work. But we have found that collaboration uh, is not as easy to achieve, uh, is not as hard to achieve as we as we thought. And that what we need to keep is an open mind and to look for ways um, to deliberate, discuss and uh, figure out different structures from those that we've been traditionally comfortable with. Uh, within government, right from the beginning, it was all hands on deck multiple officers, multiple departments um, having to respond uh, to the pandemic in different ways, not just the health department, but also other departments like law and order, like transport, like agriculture, essential supplies, food, um, uh, rural development, panchayati raj, livelihoods, all of this. So, so it was not, um, it didn't come as a surprise to us and, and it was not unfamiliar that it would have to be all hands on deck. There have been disaster situations before. Here, the second important thing about the pandemic response in Karnataka is that the response from the private sector, from civil society, from, from NGOs, from uh, organizations, national and international organizations, has been tremendous. Tremendous. It's been unprecedented, as unprecedented as I think the pandemic itself. Um, both in the urban and rural uh, areas, 
and also at different levels, at the state level, at the district level, um, within BBMP and so on, also in the needs of and responses to the needs of specific vulnerable communities like the LGBT community, um, the sex workers, former Devadasis, seniors, um, uh, persons with disabilities, community-based organizations came forward in a tremendous way to work with us. Uh, we just very briefly about the structure, we created one very large network, an open network of uh, organizations, corporates, um, NGOs, volunteers, many of them not even um, formed into any kind of a formal society, but who wanted to help, uh, created one large unfiltered WhatsApp group. That's how we started. We also had, and then of course, um, as the days went by, two or three days, within two or three days, we already knew exactly what specific small focused groups uh, working on WhatsApp and on Zoom meetings would have to work on. For example, we had a team working on IEC, we had a team working on translations, we had a team working on, on child protection, we had another team working on work, working with workers organizations one very large team working on translating government orders about relief measures into uh, explainers and into uh, steps which would which would make it possible to uh, percolate and disseminate this information we also had this was at the state level we also had at the district level we had a lead ngo uh, identified in each of the districts in each of the 30 districts and an NGO nodal officer who was identified. The lead NGO would bring all the other NGOs of the district onto the platform. Uh, we communicated um, uh, with the state as well as with the district NGOs through online meetings, through Zoom, through WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp has been a great help in this times. Uh, and also, I should say, at the Gram Panchayat level, where we have 6,000 Gram Panchayats, elected local governments, we also had, in each of the 29,000 villages, we had village-level task forces where young people, people um, with without comorbidities, that was the only condition that we said, people without risk, you know, with a relatively lower risk, uh, even if they were exposed, uh, could participate in pandemic response at the village level. So all the way down to the um, uh, village level, we had we had a tremendous response from uh, volunteers, uh, urban and rural. Initially, we started only with looking at needs and health infrastructure within the system. But within two or three days, we realized that even as we were finding our way through, we realized that health infrastructure was not the only thing that we'd have to concentrate on. We'd also need to concentrate on the needs of vulnerable communities all through. And vulnerable communities included, we started with specific groups, but then realized that anybody who could raise a cry for help and whose, whose request for help we heard, we would have to, and we would try to find a way to reach them. Uh, we, we also, I, I also must mention the speed and the acuteness with which this, this very large network of government, corporates, NGOs, everybody who was committed to, to, the, to the problems that we were trying to solve um, uh, was working. We were making very quick assessments of strengths, of requirements, um, and quickly expanding to other needs like relief, food, dry rations, cooked meals, shelter, transport, um, sometimes other kinds of specific kinds of help. There would be senior citizens who needed, who were not able to reach somebody, somebody calling from abroad, sending a message from abroad, not able to reach their parents. We would figure out ways. So what we were trying to do was to address at one level, large systemic issues of larger groups, but also try to respond at a granular level to the specific needs of people, because those are often um, uh, often forgotten in disaster responses simply because of the scale of the response. Uh, we found that this kind of a flexible network would uh, allow us to work continuously on larger scale systemic problems, but also to find volunteers who would be able to take up each of these systemic, so uh, each of these individual requests. And what we did was quickly evolve a system of uh, ticket raising for each of these open complaints. And we had a very simple manual feedback system 
to to close such complaints and to get a status update um, uh, this was backed by again a tremendous group of tech volunteers uh, who brought in um, a, a, a very simple dashboard which quickly expanded we had people from startups we had people from triple itb we had people from the it community sap labs intel other volunteers um, we had other amazing tech people who helped us um, I should also mention that uh, th we had a very small and young team of volunteers, students, um, uh, people who were stuck here last year while waiting to go back abroad for their studies, PhD students and others who wanted to help in whatever way they could. And we were also blessed to have very experienced and very senior disaster response pro professionals who worked with us. Um, we had long-term NGOs like Sampark, which worked with migrant resource centers for a long time. We had um, groups like Whitefield Rising, who are very strong citizen um, uh, groups based out of Bangalore. Uh, we had Azim Premji Foundation, uh, which is one of the greatest, uh, the largest uh, funding organizations. But we also had very small little distributed groups of volunteers who came together just to help at this time. Um, uh, and what we found was this was a way of working which would help us to cater to different levels of problems. Just to give you two examples, there were evolving problems. During the lockdown, we found that farmers from neighboring districts who typically sent their produce to Bangalore or to neighboring districts for things like marriages, you know, large weddings and temple ceremonies and things like that were finding that their produce was not getting picked up. But we also found that on the other hand, there were huge groups that were working on providing relief to people in distress, providing hot food and so on. And so we, with a little bit of effort, we were able to establish these connects so that hundreds of tons of fruits and vegetables which were produced and uh, which were produced in nearby districts and which would have otherwise gone unsold or sold at a, at a throwaway price were able to be delivered and delivered to people uh, in need who would also thereby gain valuable immunity through this. Uh, I want to share two very small stories. One was um, uh, both from uh, from last year, from the first wave. I think this, these were, one was, I think in the first three days of the lockdown, uh, it was a message that uh, I got from someone in Dharwad uh, because uh, all of our phone numbers were uh, circulating. And one of the WhatsApp messages was about three workers, three workers from Karnataka who were stuck in Maharashtra in one of the districts because their contractor had abandoned them. And I remember, um, we tried, we immediately, it was almost like electricity through the night, a group of uh, people, civil servants, volunteers, NGOs, others, uh, media people worked together and ensured that within six hours, uh, this group of workers were provided food. And then since they were still very panicked and very, very stressed, uh, within two days, they were brought to the border and eventually they were managed, they were able to reach home. This was one of the special um, uh, things of the of the um, uh, pandemic. One of the stories that has remained with me because, you know, it's it's sometimes it's easy to the to, to solve the problems that are easier. None of these problems are easy, but it's easier to solve the larger problems, the systemic problems. Um, but it's also important to solve uh, the problems of people who are individually in crisis, and that was one of the things that stayed. Uh, there were many stories like this. There was another story which which uh, stayed with me, and this was when there was a group of workers from Purulia and West Bengal who were traveling from Rajasthan, where they were working. They were migrant workers. They were traveling through Uttar Pradesh to Bengal, and there was an accident. Some people died. More than 20 people died. The next day, it was tragic. The next day, I got a call from an NGO partner in uh, Anikal who said that they had one migrant worker who was the son-in-law of a gentleman who had died in the UP accident. And he desperately needed to go to Purulia. He needed a train um, a birth to go to Purulia in one of the Shramik trains because he needed to be there for the funeral. And of course, we tried, we organized and we managed to, you know, by speaking to people and uh, uh, got, got this uh, gentleman onto the train and he managed to reach. He sent a message after he reached. It was extraordinarily powerful and moving. But, you know, 
it just made us think that here is a group of migrants, it's one family of migrants. They're from Purulia and they're working in different places. They work in Rajasthan, they're working in Anekal, and there is an accident in Uttar Pradesh. And therefore, it made me think, and this thought has stayed with me, that it's not just this pandemic, it's not just COVID, and it's not just at the end of the vaccination or herd immunity, but we need to sustain these collaborations even beyond the pandemic and see how these collaborations can continue to work and continue to grow in order to help people in distress who, uh, who can be helped uh, and who have a, a tremendous need for support from all of us, uh, people with less privilege who are, who are uh, you know, in, in difficulty of any kind. Uh, so uh, I, I think um, the, in some ways we have been able to sustain these partnerships and we look forward. We're already working on decentralized health screening with, uh, in partnership with Care India and KHP Tikanatka Health Promotion Trust. We're talking to another organization in Manipal about decentralized cardiology screening. We have many, many partnerships on vaccination. We are now working with Shikshana Foundation and ACT and others on education through rural libraries. Um, but, uh, but I think we can do much more. Uh, government tends to work typically in very comfortable, predictable, hierarchical ways uh, with a lot of control. But I think there's tremendous value in, in these distributed and non-hierarchical ways of functioning, which are based on trust and uh, which can take us in many ways much further than uh, we could through tra traditional ways. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, giving me a chance to talk. Uh, sorry, Danya, I will have to leave now, uh, but uh, I look forward to catching up with the session later. Okay, so maybe we don't have time to ask questions. No, I think, um, uh, Danya, sorry, uh, I think she got called away to a very urgent meeting last minute. Which is very understandable. Um, but uh, Ashif, um, and then we will come back for questions to the other panelists uh, very shortly. Ashif, if I could um, request you to quickly share about the Migrant Resilient Collaborator. We <coughs> all know that uh, this particular group uh, was among the most severely affected in the pandemic. So, would really like to know more about how MRC supported them uh, since last March. Over to you. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I wanted to share a little bit about like before MRC. So most of the time nowadays, particularly from last one or two years, we are discussing about like the collaboratives. And when we discuss about the collaboratives, everybody share their ideas. Ki this thing is very new in India. But I want to share my personal experience about the collaboratives. So I started Jansahas in year 2000. And basically from 2001, we started two collaboratives. So in my organization, collaborative is very like important or uh, like very crucial component of our work. And basically about 20 years ago, when we started our work uh, with the Manuel Iskwenja community, and basically we formed a collaborative of 18 community-based organization and civil society organization. And basically from that uh, period of time, we realized that if we want to create a sustainable change in our society, uh, basically, no any single organization like NGO, civil society organization or community based organization can create the impact. But if we will work together, definitely we can create a sustainable impact at the community level. So it's a, a little bit different from the uh, like the MRC. And basically, we've learned a lot from our previous collaborative effort. And particularly from last March, uh, during the uh, like the first lockdown, we realized that some of the social groups, particularly like uh, manual strangers, survivors of rape, sexual violence, trafficking, bonded labor, or migrant worker, <clears throat> they are most vulnerable or invisible citizen in our society. And they are facing multiple challenges even before uh, pandemic. But basically, their challenges and their vulnerability exposed very well during the pandemic because of the media reporting. And we saw thousands of people, uh, like the migrant worker in roads, and basically, they are walking from their destination to source. And uh, just because of that, <clears throat> many people basically realize uh, their vulnerability. We also uh, <clears throat> uh, decided if we will work with the multiple organization and if we can uh, uh, like uh, create some kind of like the 
a, a pool of information about the communities. And we release a, a, a report called uh, Invisible Citizen in April 2020. And basically, we capture the light or like the stories of 3,500 migrant workers. And basically, after publishing of that report, uh, uh, like many civil society organizations at a ground level, they basically uh, come up with the idea ki how we can help these communities. And basically, from April to June, we engage with 20, uh, 42 civil society organizations and we help about 1.5 million uh, house, uh, migrant household. And we reach out about like 6 million uh, individuals uh, during that relief work. We provided various kind of support from uh, like dry ration to cook meal to transportation support because many people uh, are like stuck somewhere and they need some transportation support to reach their houses. And then mental health support is also very, very important and crucial because lots of cases reported about the suicide or about the death of the migrant workers. So we started a helpline, toll-free helpline uh, to support the migrant worker with the mental health counseling and if they required any other kind of support, so we provide it. And this whole journey or like the efforts are very immediate response kind of thing. But after three or four months, we also realized the community required some kind of like the medium term and the long term support. And not only for the uh, like the emergent, uh, rec recovery from the uh, like the current situation, but how we can create a resilience within the community and particularly resilience within the migrant community. Because as comparative any other social group or any other community, the issues of the migrant community are more complicated because they have some social security benefits. And basically yeah, in India, we have thousands of social security benefits at the national level or state level. But these communities, like the migrant workers migrating from rural area to urban area. And in urban area, because of the uh, federal structure in India, they are not eligible to get the similar kind of entitlement or similar kind of social security benefit at destination. So basically they are living in the destination and they are not eligible to get uh, the benefit but they are eligible to get the similar kind of benefit at source but uh, because of the uh, non availability of employment or economic opportunity they are, they are migrating so it's a very complicated problem and basically in india uh, the uh, portability is another very big issue so uh, uh, like um, uh, the voting is not portable the uh, if any crime reported that's also not portable and same thing with the uh, social security benefit so they need to come back their village. So for example, if person is working in uh, Bombay or Thane and that person is coming from Jharkhand. So these kind of like the social security benefit, uh, he or she need to go back their home villages, register themselves, application for the, uh, like submit an application for the social security benefit and then they can get the benefit. So this system is not very uh, like our social security or like the entitlement delivery system is not very migrant fr friendly system. And basically, if we can discuss about the number of migrant worker. So government is claiming that in India, we have 140 million migrant worker. But actually, if you can uh, see the not for profit estimates. So the number is between 200 to 240 million. And basically, 240 million means 50% of India's unorganized workforce come from the migration. So numbers are not very small or tiny number. It's a huge population actually. But our system, and we have two laws in India. So for example, Interstate Migrant Workmen Act. This act covering some component of the migration crisis, but this act is not implementing in any state of India. So that's a one huge issue. The second issue, uh, we have another law called BOCW. So Building and Other Construction Worker Welfare Board. And in this board, basically corporate or like the companies contributing, particularly construct construction companies and the developers contributing but uh, basically the utilization rate is very very low so currently we have 39000 crore rupees in this fund but uh, as like the civil society or as state government nobody is able to utilize this amount for the migrant worker so basically in this overall like the socio economic context we decided we will launch a multi stakeholder collaborative and this collaborative called Migrant Resilience Collabor uh, Collaborative. In this, uh, uh, um, uh, like the MRC, uh, basically Jan Saha's Edelgeo Foundation and the Global Development uh, Incubator, we three organization came together, developed this uh, like idea, and then we engaged with the local civil society organization. So currently about 40 organizations helping us to uh, implement this program. As of now, we started this program in 88 districts of India across 
13 states and strategically we are trying to cover uh, all the uh, like the geography source destination and the transit point so basically uh, we are trying to track these migrant workers at each and every level and basically provide some essential support to the community as of now basically in our uh, uh, so basically four important components are there or verticals are there in the program first vertical is a social registry so basically uh, as of now no any real time tracking system available in india as as far as the migrant workers are concerned so basically we are trying to develop that kind of like social registry so we can register the migrant worker if they required any kind of support they can call us over the uh, toll free helpline or through the out, uh, outbound call we connect with the migrant community the second component of the uh, uh, collaborative is social social security for the workers so basically uh, we uh, uh, we are providing uh, uh, like very uh, essential or important social security benefit to the workers the third component is related to the worker protection so we started a, a national level toll free helpline uh, for the migrant worker and basically if they required any kind of support they can call us and we have about 144 uh, migration resource centers across india so these centers basically trying to help uh, uh, the worker in some areas so for example we are not implementing our program in jammu and kashmir or in some other states so basically we try to engage with the local organization so if we receive any complaint or any case so we uh, basically refer these cases to the local organization and these local organization also helping to the worker so uh, basically the worker protection is a third very important component of the program and the fourth component where we try to work with the industry as well as with the government and that component is more related to the responsible recruitment so as i said this pandemic or like the lockdown exposed the vulnerability of the community but uh, through the emergency response we are not able to like support the community we need a long term like engagement with the each and every stakeholders to create a tangible impact in the life of the migrant workers so basically in the responsible recruitment we are working with the companies some big companies basically uh, uh, sign up our campaign and as of now we started two big campaign one campaign is related to the one nation and one ration scheme uh, ration program and the second program is called mission bocw so in the mission bocw we engage with the construction companies big developers so they basically work with us and uh, yeah uh, as of now basically we registered about 1.2 million migrant workers in our pay platform as of now 1 million migrant worker fam household receive some kind of like the social security benefit every month we receive about 5 to 8000 calls uh, from the community and if they required any kind of support related to the rescue or em emergency support so we are helping them and basically we uh, strongly believe if you want to create a sustainable impact in the community we need to work with the multiple stakeholders or organization and my last point is ki in this kind of collaborative most of the time we are think typically we are thinking ki we can engage with the philanthropy civil society organization and the government but as per our experience role of the community or community based institution is very very important and crucial so how we can engage Uh, these organization also in the collaboratives and they can take a part of the decision making process also so yeah so i can stop now and if any questions uh, i will more than happy to answer thank you so much ashish for sharing your journey and experiences in the uh, over the last couple of decades as well as in the last one and a half years with us uh, i would now like to turn it over to danya for a very quick introduction before uh, danya you start shooting off questions which i'm sure you have Um, Danya is the editor in chief of the News Minute. The News Minute is probably among the most credible sources of news from the five southern states. Danya also serves as the chairperson of DigiPub, India's largest association of digital media publishers. Danya, great to have you here with us, and uh, uh, would also like to ask you if you would like to share uh, about how, as a media house, you responded to the crisis. uh media is one of the best ways to engage with larger community so if you'd like to share something about it and then move to questions uh, it would be great hi thanks uh, lakshmi so i'll keep my um what you asked me to talk about the news minute really really short considering we have only 30 minutes left and we may have a lot of questions in fact i have a lot of questions to ask everyone here uh so uh, the news minute uh, focuses only on southern india and uh, see we learned our lesson as in how should the media help when there's a crisis from the chennai floods and the kerala floods these were two natural calamities wherein um, 
see that there is a question before the uh, before any media house right uh, what is our primary duty it is to disseminate information to write about the crisis itself in a, in a way uh, which gives information and not to create panic but beyond that should we uh, should we do anything is a question and as an organization right from chennai floods we decided that we'll go beyond just reporting i mean i don't fault other organizations that don't do it because it is not our mandate per se so it's fine i mean we help in many different ways right even putting a story of all helplines is is okay so uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned uh, i am actually one of the people one of the founder members of chennai cares it's an organization basically a community organization of uh, uh, ngos activists uh, and uh, journalists a lot of people in chennai we actually uh, made it was very chennai centric because it was started for the floods but soon we became uh, all over tamil nadu and uh, during the pandemic i think like uma mahadevan was doing uh, during the second wave we were doing the same thing basically people could write to us on twitter Uh, or any kind of social media platform to get beds to get oxygen to get ambulances and we were working with uh, collectors of various districts or uh, or the government itself now what is very important is um, working with the government sometimes you have to sometimes you cannot because i think by the second wave the government itself had become so burdened uh, that they could not entertain every demand so we had to figure out ways in which we could do it Uh, in bangalore also we were involved with many of the ngos uh, in um, uh, in helping coordinating etc but beyond that i think that our most important function has been in disseminating information and of course in in i think in strengthening uh, what people know right uh, like last two days there has been a story doing the rounds in bangalore that more children are getting affected due to covid 19 is there going to be a third wave which impacts children but if you take a really uh, strict look at the at the numbers it's not so we don't have any numbers to support this theory that more children are getting affected because only 5% of the total number of cases even today uh, are between 0 to 9 years of age so i think as news organizations for example i believe around 60% news organizations have been pretty responsible not create panic but there has been a 40% which has created panic i try to stay away but i feel uh, as news organizations we have also learned during the pandemic what to do what not to do and most importantly to look internally as in the pandemic has been a very difficult time for journalists like for everyone else but like for in my organization most people are young they are living in different cities not with their family so their support system was people in office and they continuously are writing about the pandemic they are shooting stories about people suffering so it takes a huge toll on their mental health too and after a point of time they were cooped up in their houses there was no way they could even go out to report so it also forced us to look internally uh, not just about reporting about the outside world but how are people in our own office coping how are they functioning how do we help those people um, like do we reduce the number of working days do we arrange uh, therapy sessions for our uh, for our employees these things these were questions which came okay now i'll go to the questions shama i wanted to ask you that um, you you were focusing on women reproductive health sexual reproductive health etc before itself but when the pandemic came one of the initial conversations were about this right like how women could not leave their houses how reproductive health itself was taking a back seat so um, when the pandemic started initially i think march april everyone was sort of confused taken aback as to what is happening but then how did you decide that these will be the core uh, things that we will address and this will be the most important thing and how important was women and their reproductive health in that list um thank you danya um like you rightly said i think um the first few weeks of um the pandemic last year were spent in sort of looking at what we needed to respond to right uh, and we've been in primary healthcare uh, and in responding to community needs for uh, a long time um as i was saying that not just swasti but the group that we come from has been in social impact for now nearly 27 years um so i think what we found number one is that um we had to respond to the immediate so there was um, the 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 covid prevention and the covid related support but we couldn't ignore the other issues that we were working with and we started looking at how to respond to that as well right and that was actually one of the reasons why uh, the collab was born because partners started reaching out saying we are not able to do this the way we used to do it before how do we do it differently and we had to construct solutions right um so an example of um 
how we moved uh, last year, and this is something that we have been able to scale in the second wave and beyond, was to say what is what can go virtual and what can stay in person. Um, as a as a public health organization, we were able during the first wave also to get exemption to be out in the field. So we were in the field. We, we never uh, stayed out, and we were able to support collab partners to also negotiate and figure out how they could remain in field and remain safe. That was number one. Um, so we continued to respond on, um, you know, one of the biggest things at that time, for example, uh, that I had people reach out to me personally was to say, uh, we're actually procuring sanitary pads in a large way and we're making it available. Who is doing this? Who else is doing this? So we connected organizations on something as simple as where can you procure from? Who has these? And we had those resources because we worked on this space, uh, enabled others to also continue reaching. Uh, and we moved some of our services virtual, right? So whether we're talking about um, calling in for support, calling in for um, access to care, calling in for commodities. So whether it was sanitary napkins or food or uh, access to clinicians, uh, there, were a, there was a component that stayed um, physical because we our teams were out there, but then we had components that moved virtual. And this combination of um, digital, if I were to call it, right, physical plus digital is something that we learned over wave one. And I think it uh, really proved uh, useful for us in wave two because something that I was doing in my uh, organization is something that we were able to scale this year with many partners. And we continue to do it because uh, this reality is there. In terms of the package that you're talking about, I would say it was really dynamic. Um, the first quarter of last year and what we were doing, what was the need was very different from the second, very different in the third. And then this year, first quarter was very different because of um, uh, the second wave, right? Uh, and access to care has remained uh, uh, challenging both in urban and rural areas. And we've had to dynamically modify that, which is where sort of uh, my team within the collaborative it actually works. We are listening to partners, listening to what's available in their areas, working with them so they can respond and prioritize. Um, so women's health, children's health, uh, we you know fielded a lot of questions around immunization. Is it okay if my child doesn't get immunized? They're missing their schedule, right? Uh, and then working with primary health care centers, with the districts to say, how do we catch up? And that's something that we are doing now, right? Um, we are working on anemia. Uh, it's very scary. We're finding a lot of people who uh, have been nutritionally hit um, and, and um, people are anemic, right? We have to focus on nutrition. Uh, and even the COVID care kits, home quarantine kits that everybody was doing, we differentiated by saying our COVID care kits itself, for example, will contain sanitary napkins, will contain elements of nutritious food. Uh, and what do we build in locally? We actually, like uh, Uma Mahadevan Nam was talking about, when farmers couldn't uh, you know, take their produce, we were diverting that produce to vulnerable families because at least we could meet nutritional requirements. Uh, but we had to stay on our tippy toes throughout these 18 months to actually calibrate and recalibrate the requirements based on the realities, not just in one place, but with partners in all of the locations and communities that they serve. Okay. Um, is Ashif here? I think his camera is off. Ashif, are you here? Okay, I'll go to Mekin then. Uh, we'll we'll uh, wait for Ashim to join. Mekin, I was reading that a lot of your uh, focus was on MSME. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay, Ashim, go back. Okay, I'll ask Mekin first and come back to you. But I have a sort of the same question uh, to all of you. But yeah, sure, sure. First, uh, why the focus on MSMEs and how did that pan out first? And second, uh, when Uma Mahadevan was speaking, I mean. Uh, not to take away from anything that she said, but yes, there was a lot of collaboration between governments and private sector. But was it really as smooth as as it as it is made? Out of? In my experience, at least, sometimes there are very few bureaucrats or or ministers who are interested, and then it, it's just chaos. I mean, how do you actually streamline? I mean, there are lots of NGOs who have the understanding and who have the knowledge, also, and also the the really the strength to do things on ground. But to streamline that with any work that the government is doing, how difficult or how easy is that? Okay, so uh, Dhanya, uh, the MSME focus was actually uh, part of the two entities that I'm actually deeply involved with, Game and Udyam. Uh, I'm a founder and co-founder with them. Not so much for ACT grants, 
with ACT grants, the emphasis was primarily on health. Um, but since you've asked the question, it gives me an opportunity to speak about Udyam and Games efforts in this area. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's why okay. I asked you about that because you've yeah. already addressed ACT. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think I think in many ways uh, the impact on uh, MSMEs and MSMEs is a very very wide range, uh, right? That you have uh, like entrepreneurs who are 50 crore plus are also MSMEs and entrepreneurs who are earning less than 50,000 rupees a month are also MSMEs. So it's important to understand and segment uh, this uh, fairly well. The, I think what's, what's already been shared, what's discussed is that entrepreneurs without savings, entrepreneurs uh, who, do not have, uh, who do not have safety nets uh, were the ones who were most impacted. The lockdowns impacted them fairly terribly. Uh, so inability to run a business where you depend on daily business income to run your household uh, is devastating. Uh, coupled with that, even as businesses opened, uh, there was a massive impact on demand. Uh, like we work with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who iron clothes or who run chai shops and demand in both of these areas uh, was so deeply impacted that, hey, as in nobody needed iron clothes. Uh, schools were shut, uh, nobody was going to office, uh, and people could do without ironing. Uh, or people were scared of giving their clothes for ironing, uh, like for, at the risk of COVID. Same with chai shops. So I think across the board, uh, the impact was significant. The government, so as Udyam Vyapar, we, we first work towards basic sustainability, uh, ration kits, food, uh, et cetera, for all the entrepreneurs and vyaparis that we work with. Post which we worked on, uh, how could we do business restarter kits? How could we help entrepreneurs move online? So we ran classes on how do you sell on WhatsApp? How do you use India Mart for buying? How do you use Kata Book? Uh, so that we could enable uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs, uh, running businesses from home to be able to run their businesses in a low contact world. So, so those were some of the things that Udyam did. Uh, one of the things that Game did was to uh, try and stitch together a collaborative for being able to do financing, uh, which, which involved part philanthropy and part uh, debt. So uh, along with Northern Ark, and then Northern Ark went ahead and actually was able to, it took a much longer time than we had hoped. So eventually Northern Ark was able to uh, pull this off with uh, likes of MSDF providing first loss guarantees uh, and like regular, regular debtors or regular lenders being able to use that first loss guarantee to be able to lend uh, in these difficult times. So knowing that, hey, because of these difficult times, your return rates from MSMEs are going to be impacted. And it's very hard to predict like, hey, when the second lockdown got announced, businesses again got shut. So a business's ability to repay uh, becomes like gets hit very badly. And um, while the government has uh, announced the schemes and we all know that this, the schemes haven't, the schemes have basically allowed for people who already had access to credit uh, to be able to get a little more credit. Uh, but in the absence of demand, uh, it's very hard for a mid-size entrepreneur to take more debt because hey, where will they repay from? Um, there have been issues around, hey, like who all does the moratorium apply to? Uh, and some of that in terms of both clarity as well as actual, uh, actual execution on ground uh, for the lowest segments has been really hard. MFIs and NBFCs that serve real micro entrepreneurs, uh, those, some of those pieces have not worked out. So that's, that's a short summary of things around MSMEs. To your second question around uh, around government, uh, right? And uh, yeah, love the smile because it it there is a lot there. <laughs> there is no easy answer there. I feel uh, and uh, Uma Ma'am talked about it that it's not easy to uh, work with governments. There is a whole bunch of truisms there. We had a whole bunch of like I narrated the Goa experience, which is probably a very positive experience of being able to create impact. But at the same time, we had. We had uh, a bunch of experiences uh, that were 
where the focus shifted. So for example, we were providing oxygen concentrators and PSA plants uh, through April uh, this year and then May. And while oxygen concentrators we were able to provide at fairly rapid speed, uh, PSA plants had to be imported in a lot of cases and they took some time. And then the installation of PSA plants takes some time. So by the time some of this happened, as the, as the pandemic waned, and while a PSA plant is building long-term oxygen capacity in a hospital, uh, we saw government interest wane as rapidly in many areas. Like we have, we have ordered these large plants, they are ready to get installed and implemented. And suddenly, like the government officers are, are not interested in it anymore. Um, so, uh, because there are because there are newer problems for them to solve. Uh, right. So, and that's just the nature of how government operates. That the government operates on, hey, currently this is the most important problem, or this is the large focus areas, and this balance between urgent focus as well as, hey, what is long term capacity? Very few officers are mm. able to get that balance right. So that's just one instance of how how things with the government are difficult. They're, I'm happy to go into many more, but I'll pause now for others to be able to add. I, I'm so sorry for one minute, I was looking at my phone because we've got some good news on the digital rules has been, one part of it has been stayed by the court. We are all in, we are all in court for that. So yes, I heard uh, what you said, and I want to continue that to Ashif also. Ashif was, what Mekin was saying uh, is that there are a lot of truisms when the government is concerned. One, because you deal a lot with migrant uh, workers and the whole migrant crisis, like as a, as a journalist, I think that migrants were an invisible population, even for journalists before the, uh, before the pandemic happened. It's only now that we realize that, look, there are these millions of people who, whose lives are invisible to us, but we were not even bothered about the transportation before the whole lockdown started, right? So what do you think are our most important learnings from at least the first lockdown and how we have to improvise to make lives better? And my second question is, of course, working with the government. Is, is it a really easy proposition and how can things change? Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the first thing is key migrant communities is still invisible. And I can just give you a one example. So in India, as I said, we have about like 240 million migrant workers. But out of these 240 million migrant workers, 24% women are also there. But in the last one, one and a half year, all the media reports, most of the like the media people also co only cover the issue of migrant, uh, like the male member in the family or like the head of the family. But nobody uh, discuss more about the issues related to the migrant worker women. And basically during our, uh, like every year we release a report on the situation of the migrant community. And this year we focus more on the issues related to the women. So basically the women's safety is a huge issue, particularly migrant work, worker women. And if women coming from the rural India to, uh, so for example, women from the Bundelkhand region, and these women migrating to Delhi and CR area, and if any kind of like the sexual violence or sexual abuse they face, and if they went to the police station for simple FIR, so it's a very, very difficult and painful for them to file a very, like a, a, a first information report in the police the problem of the invisibility is, is still very very big issue uh, with the media with the civil society organization and many other stakeholders that's the first point the second thing is ki, uh, uh, like in the last one year uh, many state governments uh, try to initiate some program welfare program for the migrant community but the problem is ki when uh, like uh, uh, some uh, uh, sort of like the a challenge or like the problem exposed by the media or any other like the uh, uh, like the stakeholder so everybody like initiate some discussion so uh, some public interest litigation going on in the supreme court and the high court as far as the migrant worker crisis is concerned but the issue is key we need to develop a very long-term program so if you uh, try to respond this situation within a month or two months Nobody can able to like respond this kind of like the problem because it's a not a like a, 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 like a temporary crisis. It's a long term problem. And from last two decades, most of the like the backward states, people are migrating to the urban area for job employment opportunity. Like the climate change is also very very big issue. But nobody is discussed about the issues related to the climate change and the forced migration. 
so i think uh, 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 particularly if we want to reduce the invisibility i think we need to discuss this issue and we can create or develop a long term program not a emergency response kind of like the thing definitely emergency response required but i think if we want to reduce the invisibility we need to develop a long term program recently government introduced one program called one nation one ration uh, 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 scheme under this program about 21 crore household eligible to get the benefit but in last 7 month i think only 60000 household received the benefit under this scheme and it's a very small example because first time in indian his like the history uh, 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 where the government introduced any kind of like the portable program where the people can get the access in any state so if the person from bundelkhand and traveling to kerala so in kerala that migrant uh, family can get the benefit under the uh, uh, like the ration scheme so i think uh, we need to uh, like uh, develop the long term strategy uh, as far as the government is concerned i think the biggest issue is ki migrant uh, as per my understanding migrant worker is a very big like the political issue because uh, the people uh, uh, like migrating from one state to the another state the another destination state basically is not very much interested to provide the similar kind of benefit or similar kind of like facilities in their state because they are not uh, uh, like uh, uh, voting in the destination state so go, uh, they always going back to their source villages during the elections so i think we need to discuss these kind of like the larger is- uh, like issues also so basically if we can uh, work on these kind of like the challenges then we can increase the political will and i think the governments always uh, uh, like uh, very much interested about the like the votes so if we can create that kind of like the conversation within the political parties within the government and uh, uh, try to solve this uh, this challenge related to the portability as of now we are working with the multiple state government and in some states state government and some of the government officials are very very interested to help the migrant community so basically uh, uh, like uh, uh, now we are working with the chatisgarh government delhi government madhya pradesh government and first time basically we work with the government to rescue the bonded labor or like the migrant workers from other states so basically these are the very good experience with the state government but i think uh, all these things are going on around the pan- uh, like the pandemic and emergency response but again i wanted to st- tell you ki each and every stakeholder from media to private sector to like uh, uh, a civil society organization to the government authorities we need all need to come together uh, and think uh, together about the issues of the migrant community and basically we need to create a comprehensive program to uh, uh, like uh, ensure social security for these communities yeah but what you what you are suggesting of course is utopia where we will we will address the problems before they come so we have only 9 minutes left i'm going to do a rapid uh, fire round because we don't have time for really long answers so the first question um, is uh, from karen she uh, the question is what is the role of technology and did data sharing help you shama you want to take that quickly how important was data sharing um is- I, I would say it's important, uh, but I, I think as collaboratives, and especially because collaboratives are being asked to be accountable for what are they doing as collabs versus individual organizations, I think for all of our partners, one of the uh, things that we agree on when we agree to collaborate is to actually data share and be transparent. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the only way, and I and I think this is uh, the basis for trust within collabs is that we are able to. Uh, share data and be transparent and um, i think is fundamental uh, there's no way out of it because um, i don't know about um, the others but we are reporting uh, and being transparent about what we're doing as organizations and what we're doing as a collaborative right and for our collab it is strengthening enabling each partner's response to the communities that they're working and some common programs Uh, and being able to show contribution attribution etc so uh, i think it it's fundamental to what we're doing as collabs and technology is definitely an enabler um, but there are many technology related issues that haven't been sorted out i think as collabs technology itself requires additional work hmm mekin uh, um, the question to you of course uh, do tell us about data sharing technology itself we have had to learn a lot in the last one and a half years like how you were saying you you also focused on people Uh, you know turning to technology like even selling on india mart for that example so how important has that learning been and also quickly address like what do you think are the immediate changes that you see in the system itself yeah i i think um, 
So for data sharing, there is a need for basic platforms to be in place, uh, right? And like an example is as oxygen concentrators were being like we, a large number of people were getting oxygen concentrators and donating them and shipping them to health facilities, etc. And there was no common platform to figure like, hey, uh, has this hospital already is it, how many does it have? What's the capacity? Have they already received from another donor? Uh, who else is planning to donate to this place, etc. And we tried building, uh, we tried building this, uh, but we struggled. So we would put out as soon as we would ship any oxygen concentrators, we would put it up on our website. That hey, this is what we have done. These are the destinations for what we've. So I think from our end there was transparency, and we'd created forums uh, where anybody else who was willing to share similar data, we could then use that in our allocation algorithms, right? But I feel like the basic lack of a of a health system, right? That can say that okay, how many beds exist in this PHC? How many of them are oxygenated? Is electricity an issue? So, like just very very simple basic pieces mapping all PHCs in the country, etc. I feel are a large issue. And without building some of those very basic health stacks, uh, data sharing is only going to be like transactional and like Excel based, et cetera, which is not necessarily at one point in time, sure, you can do a slightly better answer. But if I were to look at that data right now, like, okay, who else is now building on top of the 40,000 oxygen concentrators that ACT uh, donated? I don't know the answer. So do, do you believe that one important thing that we have to address as a country, both at the government level and otherwise, is how much data are we generating and putting out there? Because I definitely feel that we don't have enough data. Oh, absolutely. We hide data. I, I I agree, and I think Nandan talks about like becoming data rich, uh, right? But for becoming data rich, we need to first put in uh, a lot of basic systems in place, like the like hey, all our hospitals need to get mapped, all our healthcare centers need to get mapped. We need to have like basic presence data, and somebody needs to be managing them, right? So like Kerala has done a fantastic job. We funded an organization called Corona Safe where. They actually had volunteers updating status of beds, et cetera, of, of ventilators, of ICU levels, et cetera. But it's an unsustainable system, right? That needs to be part of the workflow of admission into a hospital, right? When somebody is getting admitted into a hospital, one of the beds must reduce. It's as simple as that. And that data has to be transparently visible to others. And figuring out, as in protection uh, and privacy, while data being available for others to be able to build on, are very very important pieces for for like technology and data infrastructure to enable collaboration because otherwise we had cases where some of the some of the best hospitals received like 100 plus ocs from five different donors right and then we were then busy moving moving them back or moving them to a different place because hey these donors were not talking to each other and they didn't know when they were putting out requests they didn't know which of the donors might actually service them so they actually had also bulked up their requests. Uh, so, and, and eventually, as a result, some got a lot more than some others. So I feel like we, we, we need basic systems uh, before we talk about data sharing at a macro level. Uh, Zibi has a question, if you want to take it, Ashif, what are some of the main considerations while engaging society and volunteers as part of collaboration efforts? Ashif? Quickly, because we don't have times, and I'll also um, ask the same to Shama. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? He's asking, what are your main considerations when you engage with civil society and volunteers as part of collaboration efforts? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, uh, because we are working with the migrant community, and uh, these communities always traveling from rural to urban area, uh, so uh, uh, the tracking is very, very difficult. So sometimes like the people are calling us in our helpline uh, from Mundelkhand, but their relative are stick in, uh, stuck in uh, Karnataka. So basically uh, in some programs where the community is living in the same area, it's very easy to reach out them through the volunteers. But in our case, uh, sometimes we are facing lots of challenges related to the reaching out uh, to the local community. The second thing is keep uh, 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 in the migrant community, 93% people come from the social excluded groups or marginalized groups such as like Dalit or Adivasi. And within these groups, basically, we are trying to create a cadre of the uh, like the uh, volunteers 
uh, 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 some people are uh, uh, like using the technology some other people are not using the technology so we created some uh, like the solutions uh, to uh, like uh, engage with the migrant worker through the tech platforms but it's also another uh, kind of like the difficulty okay shama thanks danya uh, i think a great question uh, I, and i think there are two things for us um, i think there is alignment around values that is essential um, we realize that everybody uh, who came together and realized that you're focused on vulnerable populations and making sure that um, they were supported not just on relief but recovery and long term resilience building uh, that you know that is a sort of a core value for us and and uh, doing whatever it takes we didn't know what was going to happen but we would have to collectively figure out if you aligned to that and came on board it was very easy to work i think trust is fundamental and i think this um, uh, need for give and take you can't be only uh taking something uh, in a collaborative effort you have to give so what can you give and what do you take back and i think if these were three things that we got alignment and agreement on um then there was a lot of uh, traction and movement possible and i think these are uh, key considerations i think for all of us okay uh i just want to ask one quick question shama something from what mekin said which i've observed also for example in bengaluru the city where i live initially uh, when the pandemic started everybody was giving ration but it used to always go to the same people because there was confusion as to who to give to where to distribute so is that something that we have learned like how to uh, you know distribute relief or whatever kind of help that we are talking about and also is it still very urban centric that a lot of rural areas are not in the focus of the government and the private uh, and the ngo or the private sector um i think we've gotten better um mm -hmm. then say last year um but like mekin was saying i think if uh, organizations whether your government private or you know whatever other category you put yourself into um if we are not willing to actually uh, and this is where sort of i call it data sharing right if you're not talking about where you are what you're doing and give visibility to others it becomes very hard to then say um is the same family or the same geography being served over and over again mm -hmm. uh, i think it's it, that is where collaborators have an advantage right um, what we are seeing as the covid action collab is uh, if i have uh, 174 partners in karnataka i know who's on ground who is providing what uh, and at least for those geographies i am able to sort of say Uh, this one does livelihoods this one does help this one does education uh, they are in the same geography this is how they can work together and that is why we are creating comprehensive programs uh, i i don't think it's been only urban uh, i definitely think in the second wave more than say the first wave but uh, the the partnerships and collaborations and work has happened uh, both in the rural has it been sufficient probably not has it been sufficiently uh, distributed and addressing all the issues given the kind of realities we are in definitely not um, but Uh, this does require uh, this willingness right and and that's where i think um, more of us and we work with whoever we said we will do whatever it takes work with whoever uh, government entity private whatever to try and make this work because our focus is finally on the outcomes that people are having Uh, and i think that is very important and to your earlier question of uh, government etc i think if we realize that we are all serving the same people right and then are willing to make that transparent and say we will not duplicate if you are already doing it i'll go where it's not there it makes it easier but unfortunately like mekin said we don't have those systems we have to figure them out and figure them out repeatedly um and uh, we've tried to do that intuitively or through our partners and whatever information that we are getting it'd be great if that were more uh, transparent and, and seamless but it's not so there are limitations and i think we will see continue to see that until we all get together and work more uh, seamlessly and transparently dania mm. 30 second addition to that uh, i feel very happy with the kind of, with the way some of the things have moved in kerala with uh, an initiative we've been supporting around corona safe which is focused a lot on this capacity building right whether as in both technology systems and data uh, as well as like how do those get integrated into government uh, operating systems right uh, which government employee works on which systems and training provided for them and human capacity being built so i i feel like it's important and i'm just glad to see that there are states 
which are willing to invest in uh, this systematic institution building so that crisis can deal slightly better than this one okay thank you for that mekin i i can see lakshmi very uh, uh, lakshmi wants to just finish the session now lakshmi go on uh, no no i am happy to um, you know, go for another round of questions or responses i am just being a little conscious of the fact that uh, it is saturday evening but um, i just want to leave it open for any closing comments uh, from all of you or then if you have any last questions as well no i think uh, most of us are agreeable on the fact that the pandemic has been a learning lesson for everyone we've had to adapt we've had to learn new things uh, unlearn a lot of things so that's definitely there in the pandemic um i believe that um capacity building like mekin was saying is really the key to solving most of our problems uh, and if that capacity building is not done then god forbid if a third wave does come then we'll be stuck in this loop and as ashif was saying we need to reduce the invisibility of people we have to start addressing their issues even before the issues come in i mean we can't be talking about uh, millions of migrant laborers and and you know and turn a blind eye towards them like the bangalore metro the people who are building the kind of places they are living in the ration that they are getting are we addressing that now so we need and if uma ma'am was there i would have told her that though it sounds nice there has to definitely has to be more streamlined cooperation between the government and uh, all the other sectors and many times the government is closed to help from others uh, to at least streamline it they are okay if the private sector or the ngo does it on their own but to streamline it at least i have seen resistance from many government quarters so i hope that also has reduced with the pandemic sure um, any any comments from any of the other panelists any closing comments yeah i if i can go uh... i feel what the pandemic and the collaboration the collaboration that has happened has taught me at least is that there is willingness uh, across very large set of people very diverse group of people uh, who otherwise you would not think would collaborate like act grant has in its ic uh, venture capitalist who otherwise fight over deals uh, right but here when they are working Uh, and and the, the same story has operated with delivery as a logistics partner cooperating with ecom express who are a competitor uh, and and not just competitors in the private space but private space startups governments working together to make a solution happen is possible and has happened uh, i feel it's worthwhile to uh, not get siloed i often see non profit organizations unwilling to work with for profits and vice versa uh, and i feel if you are solving a problem uh, i think being problem centric and focusing on whoever can best solve or best solve a part of the problem let's work with them so that the problem gets solved so that the people that we are working for get impacted instead of getting lost in the mechanics of you know this should only be done in a for profit way or in a non profit way sure uh and i think this kind of ties up really well mekin with um than your point as well as mekin's point ties up with some of the points that came up in our earlier sessions on collaboration as well which is that uh you know when you are working in a collaborative form you really need to let go of individual organizational egos and just work with whoever can do it best and not stick around to points of view or um positions you've taken in the past so it uh, and, and that really opens up the way for new forms of collaboration and mekin as you said uh, repeatedly it's, it's come up in past discussions that uh, the pandemic had, maybe because it was a public health crisis maybe humanitarian crisis uh, really opened the doors for organizations to come together very quickly people who never thought would come together came together very quickly maybe because it was a highly emotional thing there were immediate outcomes but the key question is how do you take these lessons and uh, convert it into long term strategies or long term ways of working uh, to address what we know are big problems in a more systemic way so um, capacity building when as you highlighted in uh, you know also came up is something that we need to work on not just for ngos for government we need to work on it um, across the board for all stakeholders so I, um with that I'm, i'm conscious of our time but this has been great insights from all of our panelists 
Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to share your experiences with us. Danya, thank you so much for anchoring what was a really good conversation. And uh, once again, I hope all of you found, all the audience members found it useful and interesting. Uh, thank you once again and wishing everyone good night and a very happy Independence Day tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Happy Independence Day. Happy Independence Day.